Well, good morning. My name's Dave Miles. I'm uh, one of the pastors here at Moraga Valley Presbyterian Church. We're glad you're here on this beautiful Super Bowl Sunday. We want to invite you to stand up and join us. This is also Communion Sunday, so if you need to run and get the elements right now, a little bread and juice, go and do that. Psalm 100, verses 4 to 5 says this, Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise, for the Lord is good. Now this afternoon... We're going to be standing and cheering for some football team, so let's not be stingy in our praise as we enter his gates with thanksgiving. I'm glad you're here. toward your goodness my heart set on who you are you're the light that consumes the dark the joy and the strength to lift up my hands and sing and I enter the because we have so much to be grateful for. So I just want to encourage you to sing out in your living rooms, lift your hands, clap, whatever you want to do to enter into his presence this morning. Amen.
And God, it is to you that we bring our praise to you this morning. Would you receive what we have to give you? Because you are worthy of it all. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. If you're on our patio, if you're at home, you may have a seat. Thank you for joining us in worship. I'm Pastor Dave Ricketts, and it is my pleasure to serve this church as we are for La Mirinda. If this is one of your first times joining us here at our church, we'd love to get a little bit more information from you so we can share a little bit of information about us. You can click the Connect uh, link that should be there, and we, you can just fill in a brief information, and we'd be glad to share a little more information about who we are as a church. And parents, if you're watching with your kids, there's a link as well that's available for you to click right now for kids' curriculum uh, uh, that's available for your children on this Sunday morning. We hope you take advantage of that as well. As I mentioned, we are for La Mirinda, and as we said last week, we have begun to stream our services on Facebook as well. So if you're uh, available and you're watching this online, switch over to Facebook really quick. Find our service and click the share button right there. And let's begin to share our service far and wide. I had a, a friend of mine who's a guy who works for Amor Ministries down in Mexico share our service with his friends last week because he saw that I shared it. So we encourage you, share our service far and wide and help us be for La Mirinda. I want to remind you as well that Ash Wednesday is coming up on February 17th, and Pastor Tommy and I will be here that morning from 7 to 8 a.m. Uh, we will be down in our parking lot. We will be, uh, have ashes to provide for you, and we will be praying for people as well. So on Wednesday the 17th from 7 to 8 a.m., if you'd like to come by, Pastor Tommy and I don't want to be there by ourselves, so please come join us as we celebrate that day. Today, later on this morning, we are going to have our first sort of all-comers summit, uh, which is going to help our church kind of come to grips with our history, who we are, where we have been, uh, before we can begin to look ahead to figure out where is God calling us to go. We know many of you have been around our church for quite a long time and have some history here. We need to know it. We need to be reminded together about how faithful God has been to us here as a congregation. So please, if you have not yet signed up, it is not too late. You can click on the link that's available there right now and sign up for today's summit. We would love to have you sign up so we can make sure to get you in a small group where it'll be a lot easier for you to share rather than this large Zoom call with lots and lots of other people. So join us for that. It'll take about 90 minutes, but we need your input today. That's at 11 a.m. shortly after our service ends. As we transition to our time of offering, I want to let you know that our church's foundation will be sending a, a mailer to everybody encouraging you to think about uh, giving your uh, money to them as sort of in perpetuity. They have a fund so that you can put them in your will and in your trust uh, so that our church will benefit from your giving for years and years and years to come. So please take a look at that. We'd love to answer any questions you have about that, and there's contact information there. You know, again, as we enter into this time of offering, I just want to say thank you. We have so many volunteers that help make this service possible each and every week. We have not only our worship team that's been up here helping us uh, lead worship, we also have an entire technical team that are working the cameras here today, that are working downstairs, helping make it possible for this service to happen. People that are here on Sunday mornings outside welcoming you and greeting you people that are cleaning up after you. So there are so many people that make what we do possible, and we just want to say thank you to each and every one of you. You are valuable in giving of your time and your talent and your treasures. You know, that song we just sang talked about Jesus and the, what he gave for us, and there's an old uh, song that says, Jesus gave it all, all to him I owe. And as we give today, we, we don't expect you to give all back to Jesus today, but we would encourage you to give proportionally. As Jesus has blessed you with the blessings that he has, we encourage you to give back to Jesus and give of what Jesus has given you today. Let me pray for our offering, and then there's a chance that you can give. You can click online, and you can text the number here to give. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for the many people that offer themselves to make this church what it is. Lord, not only the volunteers that are here giving of their time, but people in our congregation, Lord, that are so generous with what you have provided them. 
Lord, thank you for all of that. And would you help each and every one of us to continue to give out of what you have blessed us with, Lord. We want to worship you with everything that we do, including our giving. So Lord, receive these offerings today. In your name we pray. Amen. Good morning. We're going to continue in our sermon series today from the book of Nehemiah, chapter 5. So I want to invite you to turn in your Bibles to Nehemiah, chapter 5. Nehemiah, chapter 5. I'll be reading from the New International Version of the Hebrew Scriptures. We're going to read verses 1 to 13. If you don't have your Bibles, your hand held out, the Scripture will be on the screen as we read. So Nehemiah, chapter 5. Hear the word of the Lord. Now the men and and their wives raised a great outcry against their fellow Jews. Some were saying, we and our sons and daughters are numerous. In order to eat, us to eat, and to stay alive, we must get grain. Others were saying, we are mortgaging our fields, our vineyards, and our homes to get grain during the famine. Still others were saying, we have had to borrow money to pay the king's tax in our fields and vineyards. And although we are the same flesh and blood as our fellow Jews, and though our children are as good as theirs, yet we have to subject our sons and daughters to slavery. And some of our daughters have already been enslaved, but we are powerless because our fields and our vineyards belong to others. And when I heard their outcry and these charges, I was very angry. And I pondered them in my mind, and then I accused the nobles and the officials. I told them, you are charging your own people interest. So I called together a large meeting to deal with them and said, as far as possible, we have bought back our fellow Jews who were sold to the Gentiles. Now you are selling your own people only for them to be sold back to us. They kept quiet because they could find nothing to say. So I continued, what you are doing is not right. Shouldn't you walk in the fear of our God to avoid the reproach of our Gentile enemies? I and my brothers and my men are, are also lending the people money and grain. But let us stop charging interest. Give back to them immediately their fields and vineyards and olive groves and houses and also the interest you are charging them. One percent of the money, grain, noon wine, and olive oil. We will give it back, they said, and we will not demand anything more from them. We will do as you say. And then I summoned the priests and made the nobles and officials take an oath to do what they had promised. I also shook out the folds of my robe and said, 
In this way, may God shake out of their house and possessions anyone who does not keep this promise. So may such a person be shaken out and emptied. And, this, and at this, the whole assembly said, Amen. And they praised the Lord, and the people did as they had promised. Now, in the, in the middle of December, I experienced identity theft. Uh, it is unbelievably annoying. And in my case, it involved attempted extortion. Uh, someone had hacked one of my internet accounts, took over my emails, uh, my Facebook page. They hacked an airline account, uh, a Walmart account, tried to get into my Instagram account. They stole a large number of frequent flyer miles and monetized them. They nearly got money from a gift card at Walmart. I mean, they changed and disabled my email. And who knows else what. And it took days to unravel the whole thing. And here's the thing to keep in mind. I am utterly powerless to do anything about it. I mean, outside of taking a defensive posture and canceling accounts and changing passwords and emails, I am stuck. And, and, uh, and you know what drove the whole thing? Greed. Money. Money drove the whole thing. Now, most of us listening kind of resonate to my dilemma. And maybe we've been there. But in terms of the injustice of the whole thing, truthfully, it was pretty innocuous. Uh, really uh, more of an aggravation and an inconvenience. But I want you to think for one second. Imagine some, someone coming into your home, taking your possessions, and then taking your home, and then enslaving you and your children, and you could do nothing about it kidnapping you and taking you someplace to work for them and you could do nothing about it. No power at all. Now I want you to stop and feel that. I want you to stop and feel the anger of it. The humiliation of it. You're absolutely powerless to do anything to stop it. Feel that. And that's what you have in Nehemiah chapter 5. And that's what you had for several hundred years in this country in terms of the slave trade. And the truth of the matter is that's what you have this weekend in the human trafficking that's going on here on Super Bowl Sunday 2021. One of the highly, most highly human trafficked days or weekends of the year in these United States. And some people will even say that that's what we have in social media where algorithms literally sell your attention to the highest bidder through Facebook, Instagram, uh, YouTube, and so forth. See the movie Social Dilemma if you want some more information on that. Now, here's the deal. We are in a sermon series on the book of Nehemiah called Growing Forward. And the book of Nehemiah is the story of this cupbearer to the king of Persia, this Jewish cupbearer, to the king of Persia, who then goes to Jerusalem, becomes the governor, and rebuilds the wall in 52 days. And it's not just rebuilding a wall that he's doing, it's rebuilding a community. And one of the things that he does to rebuild this Jewish community is to deal with justice issues, and in particular, in this case, the issue of of greed. It is a big deal right here in Nehemiah chapter 5. And it's a big deal for us. Because what is often for us a very simple inconvenience, like for me, a very simple inconvenience, annoying, yeah, they stole stuff, but relatively innocuous. What is for us a simple inconvenience is for others a daily way of life. A daily way of life. Now, by way of reminder, Nehemiah is the story of the cupbearer of the king. And in chapter 5, we have a situation that comes to the forefront while the wall is being rebuilt. It is so complicated that Nehemiah has to take time, verse 7, to figure the whole thing out. It involves greed 
and the misuse of power and money. And even today, Old Testament scholars cannot entirely agree on what is happening. But Nehemiah thoughtfully and wisely negotiates a solution to a very difficult issue that's instructive for us as we face these things ourselves. It is profoundly practical, and we are going to see two things in this passage. We're going to see a problem and then a solution to the problem. A problem and then a solution to the problem. So first, the problem. Here it is. Greed had blinded the eyes of the rich to the plight of the poor. Greed had blinded the eyes of the rich to the plight of the poor. Let me tell you the story. Now, the text says in verses 1 and 2 that there was a great outcry from the people and their wives against the nobles. Now, the fact that the women were complaining in this day and age, it's a big deal because back in the day, they didn't. So here, scholars will tell you the fact that the women are making a big deal about this. This tells you that this is a huge problem. And the complaints are actually summarized in verses 1 to 5. First, there has been a famine, and they had no food uh, because there, uh, the, the, ho- there was hostility from those outside of the Jewish community. Commerce was bad you know, and strained. And since they had been working on the wall, they couldn't even work their lands and harvest their crops, and these people were hungry. That's the first problem. But then second, they didn't have money to buy, to buy food or to pay the king's taxes. So what they ended up doing, and this began before Nehemiah even got back to Jerusalem to rebuild the wall, what they began doing was mortgaging the property to get the finances that they needed. Their, their property became collateral on loans to pay the bills and to buy food. And then things got really bad. Because this started a downward cycle, you know, where their property was mortgaged. They couldn't pay it down because they still had no money. They st- still didn't have any food. So what they were doing is they were, they were selling themselves into debtor slavery to pay the bills. And not only were they selling themselves into debtor slavery, which is what they did back in the day to pay off the bills. They didn't have the mortgages. They didn't have, uh, they didn't have uh, Uh, ways to address it. Uh, They couldn't go bankrupt, okay? So they they would go into debtor slavery, and then they were selling their kids into debtor slavery. And then on top of that, some of the families were giving these rich nobles their daughters as second wives, all to get money to pay the mortgages and to pay the bills. And there was no end in sight. It just got worse and worse. And in the words of the people, we are powerless because our fields and our vineyards belong to others. And while much of what the rich nobles was, were doing was perfectly legal in the Jewish law, Deuteronomy 24.10 says you could use property as collateral, what they were doing was perfectly legal, yet the way they went about it was destructive and, 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 and not in line with the intent of the law. Now for them, it was simply a good investment to take property and frankly large amounts of property as collateral on a loan. But it did not promote human flourishing and did not promote the common good. In fact, what it did is it destroyed the economic and social fabric of the very community and it had been going on for some time. It was all rooted in greed. The greed of the rich blinded their eyes to the plight of the poor. There's the problem. Now for us, this is a sober warning. Beware of greed, says Nehemiah. Beware of the lure of money. Now I'm not saying that money's bad, and neither is this text. In fact, Nehemiah was a very well-to-do person. He made his money being the cupbearer of the king. He was rich. But its lure, that is the lure of money, can blind us to its destruction in our own lives and in the lives of others. You know, I've read that there are roughly 2,000 verses on poverty and the poor in the whole Bible. 
And many of those are in the Old Testament, which by this time, the people in this story had because Nehemiah is most likely the last book written in the Old Testament, written about 430, 430 years before the time of Christ. And yet these truths, which they were certainly aware of, did little to sensitize them to the needs of others. You know, greed is one of those sins that you can easily hide. And it can easily hide itself, making it very easy to rationalize away. If you commit murder, you know when you're doing it. You steal something, you lie, you cheat, you know it's happening. You commit adultery, you know you're doing it. Look at this, you're not my wife. Okay, so you know when you're doing that. But greed is different. It's deceptive. All of us struggle with it, even little kids. You give a kid a bag of M&Ms, you give the kid the bag of M&Ms and ask for one, what are they going to say? No, mine. Mine. But I just gave it to you. Mine. Jesus says a lot about greed. In fact, in Luke 12, 15, he says, be on your guard against all kinds of of greed. You know why? Because there's a lot of ways to be greedy. A lot of ways. That GameStop stock surge this past week, uh, several weeks, has been described in the paper as rooted in greed at a variety of levels. And there are things in our society that are so much a part of our culture, we don't even notice that, in fact, what we're doing is being greedy. For example, having money to pay a bill and not doing so so that you can leverage that money for yourself even while the person you owe the money to doesn't have it right there. They go without it. It's greed. It's taking advantage of another person. And there are all kinds of things that we do just like that. Beware of greed, says Nehemiah. Beware of greed. It will blind you to the plight of those around you. Think about it. What is it that you do? What is it that we do that's legal but morally problematic and socially destructive? Think of the banking crisis of 2008. It was fueled by greed at all levels, and most of us never saw it coming. And greed is often very subtle. Now, Jan and I lived in New York City for 27 years. Uh, we went through Hurricane Sandy. And in our neighborhood, after that, it was, a, it was a, a tremendous storm, okay? But after that storm, there was a large branch hanging over an electric or phone line uh, over a major or a significant road in our neighborhood, one that everybody used to, to leave the neighborhood. And the reason I know it's, they would, knew it was there is because I went on a run the next morning after her, Hurricane Sandy and ran right under it and saw, you know, if this thing falls, it's going to kill me. So I, 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 there was a guy in the, in, the, in the neighborhood taking down trees. Frankly, he was price gouging to do so. So I asked him, I said, listen, why didn't you go down and take down that limb? I mean, it was, a 30, it was 30 yards and maybe five or 10 minutes of his time. I said, please, take the limb down because somebody in our community is going to get killed. We already lost one person. We're going to lose somebody else. You know what? He wouldn't do it. You know why? Money. His excuse. Who's going to pay me? Money. Beware of greed, says the Holy Spirit through the pen of Nehemiah. It can blind our eyes to the plight of the poor and those around us. Now, that's the problem. That's the problem. So what's the solution to the problem? Well, it's actually found in verses 6 to 19. We're going to focus on verse 6 to 13. But the solution to the problem is this. Do the hard good for the common good in fear and love of God who is the ultimate good. Do the hard good for the common good in fear and love of God who is the ultimate good. Let me tell you this story. Now it appears, <clears throat> it appears 
verse 7, that Nehemiah literally stops the work on the wall to address the issue. And he calls a large meeting, and he lays out the charges before the community as a whole. He says, verse 7, you're exacting interest. Now, what that means is actually kind of unclear. Most scholars, I mean, people haven't totally figured it out. But what it probably means is that they had, to, they had made collateral on loans so large that people couldn't pay them back. For example, you need to borrow $10,000, I'll take as a collateral in that $10,000 your $200,000 house. Well, yeah, but that's $200,000. You want the 10? You got to give me the 200. It was something like that. And it, and it made it virtually impossible to pay these loans back. And he points out the insanity of what has happened. He says, hey, when I got back here from Persia, me and my people were buying, that is, paying off other people's loans for the Gentiles so that we, we redeemed them from debt or slavery so they could live productive lives and our community would be rebuilt. But now you, the Jewish community, you're doing the same thing and you're doing it while we're rebuilding the wall. And in verse 8, we read, they kept quiet because they could find nothing to say. Guilty as charged. And in verse 9, Nehemiah says, what you're doing is not right. Literally, what you're doing, it's the Hebrew word tov, what you're doing is not good. It's not good. Now I want to repeat what I said earlier. What they were doing, in some cases, was perfectly legal according to Jewish law, but the way they were doing it did not line up with the intent of the law, and it was not good. And herein is the tricky thing about the use of money and resources and power and capital of various kinds, including capital that, you know, our education, our family of origin, those are all, that's capital. And there are things done in society and in business that may be legal, but it's not good. And God is calling us to consider what's good, what's productive, not only for ourselves, but for others. And it's a hard good because it's costly. It's costly. In fact, I should have personally paid for the removal of that limb in my neighborhood. I had the money to do it. I was three houses down from where I lived. I just didn't do it. It's costly. And in fact, this term good here is in fact, in part defined by its use in Micah chapter 6, verse 8, where the prophet Micah says this, God has shown you, O man, what is good. Same word. God has shown you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with your God. That's what's good. That's what's good. And the challenge for us as the people of God is to use our resources and our power and our positions of authority to create that kind of good, the common good, so that life flourishes and community is built and people move towards the dignity that's theirs as individuals created in the very image of God. And we're to do that for everyone. That's why we're for La Mirinda, the hard good for the common good. Now, this does not mean that we sign off on people's immoral or destructive behavior. That's not what Nehemiah is calling us to. But it does mean that so far as we are able to do the hard good, we do it for the common good. In fact, in verse 10, most scholars will tell you that Nehemiah himself discovered that he too was guilty in this regard. 
He had been giving loans with collateral, not as bad as the others, but loans when people needed gifts. And his challenge to them and his challenge to himself and his challenge to us is to do the hard good for the common good. And then in verse 9, he tells us why. He lets us in on the motivation. And he says, verse 9, should we not walk in the fear of our God? Should we not walk in the fear of our God? That is to say, shouldn't we do the hard good for the common good? Because God is the ultimate good. Because God is the ultimate good. Let me explain a little bit more. When he notes that should we not do this in the fear of our God, he is not just referring to this kind of generic understanding of God. He's referring to the God of the Mosaic Covenant, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who called his people, the people of Israel, into a very distinct lifestyle. The way they treated each other was to be different than the way the other nations treated each other. And the way they treated each other was designed to show the world who God was and what he was like. We can see this in 1 Chronicles 22, verse 5. So when they enslaved each other and they took large collateral on loans, even if it was legal, what they were doing was creating the opportunity for the enemies of God to make light of his glory, to degrade the living God in the eyes of the community. And what Nehemiah is telling us to do, he's telling us that the way we use our money and the way we use debt and the way we use power and resources and education and law and medicine as the people of God, it's not simply to be for our own good, but for the good of the community and for the glory of the living God. And the motivating factor for all of this The fear of God. The fear of God. Now, I'd like to take this one step further. Because in verse 9, this fear of the word fear of God, the phrase fear of God, is very similar to the theologically rich phrase fear of the Lord, which we find throughout the whole Bible, the Old Testament. And we see in Deuteronomy 6, 2 and 4, that this phrase, the fear of the Lord and the love for the Lord, are essentially the same thing. The fear of God isn't just being sobered because he has the keys to hell and heaven, but the fear of God is also a love for God, so much so that we're motivated to obey him because we delight in him. These two truths work together, the fear of God and the love of God. Think about it. What motivates you to action? Beauty, delight, joy, and love. It draws you in. And what Nehemiah is telling us is that when we see God for who he is, his beauty, his loveliness, his glory, his goodness, we're going to want to do the hard good for the common good out of fear and love for God who is the ultimate good. And this text tells us that there are consequences for not doing what is good even if it's legal. And this text tells us that there are benefits for doing what is good, even if it's not that profitable. Because God gets glory, and people are honored and served. So how we handle ourselves in our various vocations as followers of Jesus Christ, it reflects on God. So, for example, it may be good to sell our house for less money to a person who isn't as well off as we are so they can own a house. It may be good to invest some of your resources in this church's foundation because it will take the money invested and multiply it for others' benefits in ways that you may not be able to do on your own. It may be good to give a used car away instead of selling it because somebody else 
needs a car. It may be good to start a business in a poor community and use the labor from that community to bless that community instead of starting a business in, say, a more profitable community, uh, a more profitable business in a well-to-do community. It may be good to give your stimulus checks to someone who needs them more. It may be good to offer some services, educational, legal, and medical, pro bono for people who can't afford them, and even if they don't appreciate all that you're giving them, and especially even if they are thankful, it may still be good to give those services. It may be good to do what's in other people's benefits, even if those people don't like you or are critical of you. It may be good to provide food for our food pantry and work on hygiene kits for the Bay Area Rescue Mission. It is good to promote human flourishing. It is not good to take advantage of people. Now I want you to notice in verse 11, Nehemiah, at verse 10 and 11, he asked them to give back their fields and the olive groves and the vineyards and the homes. They are to make restitution for the way greed had blinded them. And that's part of reconciliation and part of community building to make restitution. It honors those who have been hurt. And then in verse 12 and 13, he, take, he has them take an oath, which is a way of making a binding agreement that they would do what is best for the community in the fear of God. And they did. They took this oath. But you know what's interesting? And we're going to talk about this more next week. It is clear from the book of Nehemiah, and we're going to see this particularly in chapter 13, that it didn't take long for the people of Israel to go right back and fall right back into their old patterns behavior. It wasn't natural for them to do the hard good for the common good because of God who is the ultimate good. It's not natural for them. It's not natural for us. And the truth of the matter is it's not natural for me. Given the opportunity to pay to two to three hundred dollars to bless our community and pay the guy, remove, you know, cutting down the trees in the neighborhood, to, you know, to, to do that, I, I had to, all I had to do was walk down to the house and get the money. We had it. Given the opportunity to do that, to save someone's life, it never occurred to me to go home and get the money. Never came to my mind until later. And this all points to another place in Scripture, the New Testament, Mark 10 and Matthew 19, in another story about money and greed and a man referred to as the rich young ruler. And in that story, this rich young man comes to Jesus and he says, you know, he calls him good. He says, good teacher, good teacher, what must I do to, 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 to gain eternal life? And Jesus says, why do you call me good? There's only one good, and that's God. And what both of these texts tell us, the one in Nehemiah 5 and the one in Matthew 19 and Mark 10, what they tell us is that despite our best efforts to do good, despite my best efforts to do good, we often do bad. And the reason is the radical self-centeredness of the human heart. But there's one who is truly good. Jesus Christ, who took, Jesus Christ, who took the bad that condemned us to death and hell and despair on himself when he died on a cross. He took it on himself and then he rose from the dead showing that, that our sin's power was broken. And because he is good, we can do good. And because his death satisfied God's justice on our behalf, we can show justice. And because he showed us mercy, we can show other people mercy. And when we put our faith in him and turn from his, our sin, 
His righteous record is credited on our behalf to us. And we become one of his followers. We become Christians. Because Christianity is not about being a member of a church. It's not about growing up in a church or getting baptized or going through your first communion or going to a Mexico trip. It's not saying the Lord's Prayer at, you know, at, at, at bedtime. That's not Christianity. It's not the hard work you do for God, as good as that might be, but the hard work that God has done for us through the person and work of Jesus Christ. And when we put our faith in him, He turns our life around and out of a deep fear and joy and love and delight, we do the hard good for the common good in deep fear and love for God who is the ultimate good. And we use our resources and our businesses to help not hurt others so that our nation and our state and our community, La Mirinda, will thrive and flourish for the glory of God. Greed blinds us to the plight of others, in particular to the poor. That's the problem. The solution to the hard good for the common good because you fear and love the ultimate good. So how do we apply this to our lives? Three simple things. Number one, ponder the beauty of God. Read through the book of Proverbs and take notes on what it means to fear the Lord. Be stunned by his beauty. Let that drive your obedience, your motives, and your thoughts. Number two, let God do a work in you so that he can use you to do a work in others. Personal renewal always precedes corporate renewal. Our outward focus as a church must come from a deep, heartfelt humility that God is birthing within us because he's changing us from the inside out. And then finally, number three, think about one good thing you can do for someone else this week. One good thing and do that. Do it for a stranger. Do it for someone you know doesn't like you. But do it. Do the hard good. So here's the question. What is God saying to you today? Now this morning, we have the opportunity to partake of the Lord's Supper. And in our partaking of the Lord's Supper, we remind ourselves of God's goodness towards us through the person and work of Jesus Christ. It's out of his deep riches that he redeems us from our sin so that we can do good to other people. So Pastor Dave now is going to lead us in our our partaking of communion. We're here again around this table because we need God's power in our lives. We need to again receive his strength, his power, his spirit that enables us to do that good. Because on my own, I, I can't. So we're here again today around this table that Jesus was at with his friends on the night that he was betrayed. To again receive from him and receive him. We're going to take him in. We're going to receive Jesus again today, admitting that we are broken people, that we are, what was the word used, horribly self-centered or uh, radically self-centered. Boy, yes, I I need help in that. And so I'm going to again receive from Jesus his grace, his power, and his kingdom and, and allows me to live into that. Let's take just a moment in silence to confess our radical self-centeredness before our God as we enter this time. Just a moment of silence together. God, we confess our need for you, our need for your forgiveness, our need for your grace in our lives, God, is we can't do anything apart from you. And Lord, we need your power in our lives to strengthen us, to encourage us, to embolden us, to live the kind of ways that you want us to. So Lord, we again receive you as we partake of this meal together. 
Amen. Well, friends, we're reminded that on the night that Jesus was betrayed, that he took bread and he broke it. And after giving thanks for it, he offered it to his disciples, saying, take and eat of this. So I invite you now, if you're sitting on our patio, if you're sitting at home, take a piece of bread and let's eat together. Thanks be to God. And friends, likewise, after supper, he took the cup. And having poured it out, he said, this is the cup of the new covenant, which is my blood, which is poured out for the forgiveness of your sins. Drink you all of it. Take your cup and drink. These are the gifts of God for the people of God to encourage and embolden and empower us to live the way that God would want us to, to bring his kingdom here on this earth. Let's rise together. Let's sing of this power, of this love, of this amazing grace that God has brought us. Because it doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter how you're feeling today. If you're hurting, if you're broken, if you're celebrating, this table is for you. Our King, Jesus, is offered to you. Let's sing together. Jesus. 
lift our voices this morning. And oh, what a Savior, isn't he wonderful? good is, well, it's, it's hard. It's just hard. But when we remind ourselves of the work of Christ done on our behalf, it becomes doable. So on this beautiful Super Bowl Sunday, go into the world in peace. Take care of the poor, the marginalized. Do the hard good for the common good. Share the gospel. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all Amen. God bless you. Have a great day. For those of you who are on the all-comers meeting, see it at 11 o'clock.